Okay, so the second aspect I want to talk about was basically, um, you know, what um, what we do when we hit um, um, rate limits. So one of the, I'll put it back, it's a very con uh, contemporary issue, or was in any case a very contemporary issue beginning of this week uh, for the APIs that we use in development. And um, one one of the uh, concerns and questions, of course, or the, the evident ones that we um, that I uh, referenced in class, of course, but uh, didn't really elaborate further on. And how, I'm not sure if people actually did it. It's just um, how to deal with rate limiting and how to you know avoid hitting it. So what 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 is the obvious way of dealing with this? Um, please let me either speak up or put it in the chat. How would you deal with this as a developer? What's your approach? Store info, yeah, store info abstractly, that's right. Bit more detail, I mean, um, the fact, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, wh what do you basically do instead of um, constantly relying on third party service? cache the information in, in some way yeah so uh what would caching is, um, typically entail if you um, I, yeah, I know it's inconvenient to type up but you can also speak up if you like um what what, what do you mean with uh, caching in particular how does that work from a um, from your application perspective what do you do Did anyone think about uh, kind of emulating the server side service? The third party service they depend on for the application? Yeah, exactly. You could store it in the file. That's right. Yes, exactly. Cache response, yeah, you can cache response to the client. Ah, okay, thanks, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so you can cache the response you get from the APIs, exactly, yes, and you can also cache response from the client, that's right. Um, yeah, exactly, so that, that goes exactly in the right direction. Did anyone do this? Oh yeah, okay, cool. Very good. So uh, some comment that uh, um, um, uh, Sebastian cached um, for six hours before making uh, any external access to APIs, which is cool. This is something you can conveniently do when you uh, when you know the APIs, right? So when you know the update f uh, frequency and cycle, so then you know exactly, yeah, it's no point for me to kind of querying this within the next six hours or even 12 hours, because I know I only receive updates at you know particular points in time. So very good point. So you can optimize against their behavior to some extent. Um, yep. Um, but let's say so the, this this looks at the solution in the um, for the actual developed service right so when you actually or what, what, uh, for the yeah for the developed service at runtime effectively how do you minimize invocations on the server side but how about doing development because that's the time um, you know where, where 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 at least in my experience I would say I would cause the most trouble because I'm trying to poke the APIs all the time. And um, 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 uh, get get some sort of uh, you know feedback that I that I want to use and um, test before my unmarshalling and so on. And this invocations is actually that that's the main uh, main problem effectively that can lead to uh, high levels of invocation on the on the server side hitting the rate limits. How could you mitigate this simply? Pretty much out of the box. Yes. So there you go. Right. So uh, I'm going to suggest to store some info from the API for testing. Yeah. And I want to get to that as well. So basically, not so much looking at the um, application when it's running, which that's exactly where caching comes in. Perfect. As a solution to minimize uh, runtime invocation. Um, but what about the design or development time um, um, invocation? Right. So, yeah. Cool. So the idea is basically there. Um, how, do, how can we do this? The idea is there that we can effectively 
uh, reconstruct um, the service that we are interested in, right? So basically, just return the structure uh, and um, um, and the content of the service. That means you don't rebuild the entire service, but you uh, reflect or represent the external interface largely. So uh, alongside the information you actually want. Um, so and then you can use this um, as kind of a, a baseline for your development, but also gives you some other aspect. And the benefit there, it gives you stability for testing, right? The actual third party API may change all the time, right? So if you think about the um, COVID cases one, it will update every 24 hours and so on. So it's really hard for you to anticipate or rely on the stability of the information or possibly even historic information can change for whatever reason, perhaps updates or otherwise, or formatting issues on their side and so on. Um, so it would be desirable, especially if you have your own service and you want to uh, ensure a certain robustness and stability on your part, or at least figure out where changes lie in this web of interconnected service provisions um, to um, you know, have a stable and controlled environment in which you can test. And that's another second use case where those um, services, those stub services can come in. And the idea is basically that this is a concept of course stubbing. The idea is that it represents um, uh, in principle, in principle, the functionality of this, you know, third party service that you are um, using, but not, of course, in detail, not with the accuracy, but it basically um, uh, responds as if it was the third party service. And from a client side, it looks like this as well. What does it mean in practice is it well, by emulating or re reconstructing the entire interface of the third party service, ideally, um, you should be quite flexible, uh, flexibly able to kind of shift between or switch between this testing or development environment and the live environment, because in the end, it would just be a matter of um, changing URL, right? So the abstraction that we have anyway, which is really convenient from a, from, a, from, a, from a web service point of view anyway, is that we work on the abstraction of URL, right? So um, it would just be a matter of kind of the switching off uh, or switching around the different URLs, um, you know, via some parameters or otherwise, ideally to make it very easy to switch between um, production and development environment. Okay, so let's see, how do, how does that look in practice? And um, of course, some of you will say, hey, hey, hang on, doesn't it mean we need to develop yet another service? Um, you, yeah, I, I'm not, yeah. So possibly to some extent, of course, but I'll show you that it's reasonably pain-free or at least I think it is reasonably pain-free. So let's see what we can do here. Um, let's see, let me share my screen again. So, the idea is basically to have a very simple stubbing service that has a very trivial, uh, trivial functionality, if you if you liked. And um, <clears throat> so this is um, that's also available, of course, in your repository now. Um, basically, you just emulate the server side functionality by you know, having some sort of uh, mini service that has, um, you know, either M e also emulates the path structure that you have possibly on a server side, you can easily do that, right? And um, the idea would be basically then just to, let's say, um, if we're interested, for example, in, in rest countries, um, Let's take alpha characters. We want to just get other thing back for, let's say, wait, typo for Norway. Um, so here's basically all the classic information rest countries in Norway, not really much magic there, right? So um, that's something basically that you would expect, for example, your service to consume, right? So you kind of need to figure out this information. Hang on, I got a thing on the chat. Yeah, so uh, just, just building on um, Sebastian's earlier point on, on caching, just to respond to it, it's basically, uh, uh, especially example for caching, basically what's the rest countries API specifically kind of uh, fitting right now, because you wouldn't expect country information to change. In fact, you wouldn't expect it to change, you know, um, significantly at all during runtime. So it could well be uh, sensible just to query it and um, store the information you need. Um, um, yeah, for as long as your service runs, uh, chances are that your service may uh, be restarted before country information changes in the first place. 
Um, so that's a very good example for this. Anyway, what I want to get at back is you need to look at the third party API and look at, okay, what's the information I actually want, right? And so you're not able to replicate this entire structure, but you're probably at least able to, uh, you know, get one representative um, um, response from this one. So, <clears throat> and uh, so here the idea is basically to reconstruct this, this server side uh, structure, nothing, no magic here, you know, all those, those calls. But the interesting bit basically lies, lies then here. So um, the main dot uh, reference is a stub handler effectively. And the only thing that this thing does is basically to uh, you know create a response. Of course, here now it's configured to only response to get methods, for example. But it uh, also creates a header uh, of content type JSON, something we know. And the only thing it provides basically as um, so here as um, f, f print um, construct basically writes back to the response writer is a string and the string is taken from a file the file passing is signaled here right so it's usually using iot read file quite straightforward and simply providing this output back and um, the file that's referenced here is the rest countries in this particular instance let me just take this and it would be as simple to for example uh, probably not put the url in there but rather the payload let's see um let's see get this payload so And prefix it with um, and basically return it right so and, and, and prefix it with a content type right so because the content type is JSON indeed because as that's that's the nature of the content source here but it could be anything really you could also return um, you know plain text or images or whatever else you of course would want to adjust of course your uh, content type that you're returning so that's quite important uh, modification actually and if you run this thing then let's see if it goes and yeah if it runs. So and there we go, right? So I just ran this now on also on, on, on the um, root um, uh, path, of course. I saw we could also introduce sub path, make it a bit more complex. But fundamentally, that's precisely what it offers you. It's the response that you anticipated. So if you have a more refined structure, for example, it's just for the sake of argument. To do that as well, you could be as simple as to running. Yes, it should be running. You can also redirect it so suddenly it sits on that path as opposed to the root path, right? So, so you know, get a 404 here because it wouldn't be available, but you would get the uh, country information at the correct path. So, you can also reconstruct and represent the path structure as it exists on the server side side. So, um, the, the idea would be really just to exchange basically the host and then you can switch between your private service and the public service effectively. So, I just want to motivate this because people, um, uh, I'm not sure, has anyone implemented such kind of thing or, you know, set it up this way or use this concept? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, caching seems to be quite popular. Um, yeah. Yeah, caching is definitely a good idea, but caching is more involved, right? This one here is super easy, the stubbing idea, right? So you don't, that doesn't think about caching really. It's oh, in a wide sense, you, you kind of, well, if you wanted to, you think about it doing it manually in a way, but it's basically just providing a, you know, dummy service in a wider sense that uh, you can, you can use and, um, you know, um, exploit doing development you're also you know if you bring it down you bring it down bad luck it's running on your machine so it's not not a big deal of course you can run it also on you know server side or elsewhere uh, but anyway that's the basic idea so if you are um, using or now for your project development in particular uh, looking at particular um, um, services or want to replicate the um, interface uh, consider using this kind of approach um, kind of to for the server side in particular but also to facilitate your testing we get to that uh, now in a second um, as well so this is provided under unusual in the git repo place it's called rest stub basically it's just a stubbing service you can immediately download it and you know make it your own adjust it to your to your needs where you see fit and so on um, no big uh, magic in that one okay so 
that's basically the idea about about stopping, right? So um, basically having a, a baseline of, uh, response, but it's not really um, uh, the whole story, of course, but it's just supports your your development in the in the first place. Um, the second aspect that we want to talk about, and I uh, just motivated a bit, but we're probably um, not getting too far um, doing this otherwise, uh, doing the actual testing, of course, is to look at testing of cloud services, because that's quite relevant for you. You guys learned about testing in various other courses, such as software engineering, I hope, in any case. Uh, you learned about, um, you know, different forms of testing, such as black box and white box testing. Um, different um, scopes um, that testing entails, right? Testing on individual units, of course, um, that is elements uh, or functions, for example, uh, in, in Golang more explicitly. Um, and um, then there's, of course, integration testing that um, looks at multiple units and their interaction um, across different levels or different modules, um, system testing, the system as a whole, and then the acceptance testing, which is more on the user side, effectively. And uh, when you are in a contract relationship or project relationship then you actually need to have the product owner uh, and its representatives kind of test this in the, in the in the wild effectively and suggest that the project requirements as they have been agreed upon at the beginning of the project project has been fulfilled and then there's of course different forms of testing that relates to you know um, well so-called non-functional characteristics including um, you know um, the performance testing stress testing and so on that may be relevant as well, but they technically don't really uh, or generally don't uh, uh, link to the um, classical functional requirements, even that, but this distinction is somewhat fuzzy in the first place. Okay, um, right. So what are the challenges when we want to think about testing cloud and web service? I mean, you did testing, hopefully, please, in, in other contexts, um, but what makes the testing so particularly challenging in the context of cloud services? Once. Ah, there's also a comment by, uh, by Dennis, which is good. Um, Postman's API mocking uh, can also do this, apparently. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, in terms of the stubbing that I've just um, showed you. But um, so, what are the challenges related to cloud and web services? Any comments are welcome. Oh, my students fell asleep. Not good. That's the downside of doing the remote teaching. You don't see the heartbeat. So, uh, or rather, yeah. Anyone? Else, I leave the chat open, and you can answer that over the probably break that you want, um, the fifteen minutes break. Um, I recommend then that we meet back at eleven thirteen now. So since I'm fifty eight only right now, um, and in the meantime, if anyone has something, please add the challenges that you think we have when we're doing testing in the context of cloud or web services. So see you at eleven thirteen, and then we continue there. You need to uh, you need to manage the setup and the teardown of the testing environment. So as an additional feature, right? So those are a set of challenges that uh, are not necessarily captured otherwise, uh, as well, or that you don't have in a conventional environment as much. So okay, right? Um, yeah. So that so that's this this point, right? So it just boils down to the complexity that we have just you know a client and a server and they're interacting some somewhat and multiple probably database behind it and whatever else, right? So the question is just how do you how do you approach this? Um, so just to um, the, the the challenge is basically you know where do you actually test, right? So we have those two instances, we have a client side and server side, and um, on on the one hand you need to think about how to test a particular entity, either the client or the server, right? Uh, and on the other hand, you also need to see who evaluates the test on the other hand, right? So who, who drives the test and the evaluation? And of course, a comprehensive testing would think about 
um, you know, testing both sides. And here, of course, depends on your service and the complexity, if there's more entities and so on. But let's say for sake of simplicity, assume a simple client server um, uh, situation here, that you have some facilities that can allow you to uh, interrogate and uh, ensure that they work to correspondence, correspondence here. So we basically have the um, evaluation of, um, you know, uh, the questions being there where to test the um, client that tests effectively server side behavior and a server side evaluation that tests the client side behavior, right? So we also need to ensure that a client, for example, that invokes a server behaves as as it's supposed to be, right? So, so those are kind of the two two perspectives on the same thing um, that I just want to highlight here um, that we kind of will be dealing with um, in, in the um, in the next few minutes. So that's the main idea. Cool. Okay. So, in order to provide a bit of a backdrop here, um, so there was a bit of throwing around two terms here, effectively, um, throughout this um, discussion, and uh, before that as well, talked about stabbing and mopping, uh, mocking, not mobbing. That's another topic to talk about, but not uh, hopefully in this context. Um, stabbing and uh, mocking. And um, what's the difference um, there? So the difference is often nuanced, and people use them, to be honest, often interchangeably, including myself sometimes. Um, and uh, the, the idea is basically there that uh, uh, this is a very relevant concept from a from perspective of testing, where we, on the one hand, um, just want to emulate server side behavior, generally relates to the server, server side behavior in as far as it's relevant, useful uh, for the testing. So that would be considered mocking. Uh, so meaning the server doesn't have any sort of meaningful implementation in the first place, but just somehow emulates the behavior. So we'll see how that works. Um, and uh, it uses that also to uh, assess client-side behavior, right? The server is no longer the implementation that it's supposed to be, let's say the REST country service, but what it actually is, is a you know testing facility in the widest sense that sees or looks how invocation on, on, on itself is performed. So basically deviating from the actual functionality that the server will have in production environments, right? Where stopping is basically a subset of the actual um, functionality that the server provides. It's just, uh, 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 yeah, not complete in any way, right? So, but in principle, it, it kind of emulates how the server will interact with you, right? So for example, if you have the country's REST API, then you're substituting the output with, you know, a fixed output, that would be considered stubbing because fundamentally it's, uh, it's providing the functionality, but it's not really uh, providing the richness, right? You don't have different paths you can navigate and all that kind of stuff, just a subset of it, but it gives you a starting point for, for the behavior. So that's what we, a stopped um, service, right? So mocking is kind of a hollow uh, a service structure that um, uh, just emulates bare behavior and has other facilities embedded, whereas potentially where's the client, uh, where stubbing kind of seeks an alignment with the original intention of the service. So, um, okay, so talking about the evaluation perspectives, so just to motivate this a bit, um, uh, uh, there, there are, as I mentioned, two pathways. On the one hand, you could want to evaluate, uh, you know, either the client or the server, but you also need to decide who is the, you know, evaluating party. So it generally means that the counterpart evaluates um, the tested entity. So if you think about the standard case that we uh, want to test a, uh, um, you know, web or cloud service, it would basically be the client sends some sort of request to a server side, surprise, surprise and awaits the response and evaluates the response, right? So giving us some sense whether the server did actually the right thing. In this instance, the evaluating or testing entity is the client and the tested entity is the server, right? So the client doesn't really assess its own functionality in this instance, but rather assesses server-side behavior, right? So that's the starting point uh, for, for, for the next um, kind of um, discussion that I want to, or example that I want to show you, so just to see a bit of a, uh, basis here. All right. So first of all, so it's a rest stop. I can leave this um, there. So it's latently related to testing, but not at the core. Um, and let's look a bit into testing to some extent. So. Um, so here's a set of examples, but uh, before we before we go into examples and how are they constructed and how we can do meaningful testing, let me just uh, motivate how testing is done in Golang again. Uh, I think uh, there has been a session on this already, so you should have a, uh, some background on doing this, but nevertheless, I'll uh, show you some um, 
principal pointers. Feel free to comment at any time. I try to keep an eye on the chat. It's not always easy, but I think I'll manage. So, um, and by convention is basically um, that the um, the testing uh, or the the, 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 um, the tests are co-located with the files they are supposed to test, and generally follow the idea that they have the same name. So, if you're testing, for example, uh, structs, you would call it structs underscore test dot go. So, by convention, the testing framework in GoLang will pick up that this is already a uh, test. You see this already showing up here. Ah, hang on, um, there's something happening here. Um, there must be tests in here, um, but simply based on a naming. The package, however, is generally the same, right? So if this is a struct package and this is the struct um, um, uh, test, then it follows, it sits in the same package nevertheless. But it also makes for a good uh, visual organization of the um, structure, which makes it quite quite straightforward and easy. So I'll just motivate what I want to do. I just want to briefly show you how the framework works. So not really write a serious test here right now, but just to motivate how the testing works so you can read it easier later on when I go into HTTP testing. So it doesn't confuse those two concepts. So what I'm going to be using here for the example is basically a very simple struct, uh, which is called message and basically has two elements, uh, you know, two string elements. One is content and one is further content. And they're basically, uh, um, um, you know, can be, uh, marshaled into JSON um, in, with respect to those keys. So not, not much magic there, super straightforward. I just want to motivate how the testing is done again in case uh, you haven't seen or um, have not interacted with this. And here the idea is by convention that you have uh, the function name starting with test. And I just um, call this uh, generally in active terms read message. So um, that's at least for now what I, how I name this thing. Um, you need to, um, the signature of tests needs to follow, of course, the conventions of the testing package. And that is basically, um, for example, this one, uh, where we have a test function that takes the, um, um, you know, the runner uh, reference as a, um, as a parameter. So basically, this is uh, how you report and indicate and uh, yeah, signal te uh, test errors in particular or confirmations there. So and you see already the system now has picked up Goland, of course, here in this instance, uh, but that's Quite a convenient helper, to be honest, uh, but you're, of course, not, you know, required to use any of those frameworks, but you see already how the conventions are picked up. It says here as a test, please run the test, right? So, and, I mean, of course, we can run the test. Don't think that there will be anything meaningful, meaningful coming out of this. And if, I would be surprised. So you see that it basically spins up the framework. It takes a while on my machine. You see it's compiling here, and eventually it will show you some, some test output. Basically just runs the test and says, well, you know, test is successful. This is the typical output you would expect uh, in, in, in the first place for standard testing. But let's come back to the message idea. And uh, how could a basic test looks like uh, look like? So let's assume we have a message and we, and we just want to test the structure, right? So um, and um, secondary. Just want to check whether it's actually doing what's supposed to do, meaning storing the information, because it will put will be that, for example, the internal structure of the uh, message struct is, is is doing something to it that's not supposed to do. Let's assume hypothetically, and then you basically just perform a, a bunch of tests. Um, you know, so if message dot content does not equal testing primary content, then you can report error, and that's how you do it. Uh, you basically call the reference to the T. Um, argument that is passed into your um, testing function and then you can report an error in there that you should be hopefully reasonably descriptive right so uh, message content is incorrect um, and you know you can change this and basically do any sort of uh, interest in the, in the further content if this doesn't correspond to what you had expected there you can basically do the same there uh, one general um, point is, of course, um, it's easy to say to write tests that pass, and I'll show you for this one. But it's also important to t to ensure that the tests actually fail when things are are going going wrong, right? So I start with failing first. Um, so I'll uh, and you see how I hard coded everything here by intent, um, you know, not to use the same um, constant, but to ensure that if they are um, changes for example in in, in 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 a constant that shouldn't be reflected in tests then the system will pick up on it so it's a case where hard coding is desirable so basically that's what the kind of area would see right the message content is incorrect 
Uh, probably TRO is more sane and sensible. Yes, fatal is a bit more because it has an access code one. It's it's really harsh. Um, um, I I tend to have lately used quite a bit. The reason is that I have had extensive tests and I didn't want to scroll through, so I didn't want the system to continue the test execution. But test error is the more uh, sane one. That's right. Uh, so more more fatal is actually really hard um, exiting. But you see already it 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 ex it, it um, responds with the um, correct error basically and signaling that you know something is going wrong here. So now I can change the spec. That's the principle of uh, test driven development that you actually check uh, whether the content is um, whether the tests actually fail before they actually um, pass. So let's see, run this again. Yeah, it's somewhat compiling. And yeah, so it seems to have passed this test. So that's the whole pattern, right? So you would have another test, basically test, I don't know, um, you know, invoke message, I don't know, and then do something else on this. But that's basically the, the out of the box functionality that's provided to you by Go in case you um, 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 hadn't, hadn't interacted with this. So, but that's um, quite straightforward. And you can see already how this kind of changed nicely into your typical unit tests that you want to do for your uh, base functionality. And many of you are, yeah, many of you have it actually done have done it for for some of the assignments or another just uh, to motivate it. But let's go back to how do we do it now? How does it translate or how do, can we use this in the context of cloud service? Because now it becomes a bit more complex um, and uh, people have been wondering, okay, how do we do this effectively? Um, that's the basically the main, main um, question there. And um, one one way of doing this is to, uh, or the question is uh, there, how can we sensibly substitute uh, functionality, you know, uh, production functionality with testing functionality to see whether in principle my, um, you know, my implementations still work. So for example, if we have a struct, hypothetically a struct request function, which in this instance doesn't do much more but to uh, invoke um, um, you know something with the target ul uh, how can we ensure that it actually works and at the same time use for example uh, standard functionality as provided by the http package so what's this one doing here this is basically meaning to invoke a get request to um, you know a particular url and you know deal with the response to some extent and then this one is modeled in a way so that it actually can um, take the default HTTP client as it comes out of the um, HTTP package from, from Golink, for example, uh, and also a signal that it's expecting a GET request. Remember, we have two types of, um, two ways rather, um, um, of, of uh, defining uh, requests in, in the HTTP package. One of them is to call the um, uh, stock new request um, Yeah, new request uh, uh, constructor, if you like, uh, that in which you can provide the method, for example, post get, you know, delete and all those puts that we discussed about the URL and then the body to perform a request. But you can also have a contrived version which is basically just saying um, uh, the get, right? So the, 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 the get call directly on a client, it basically pre-configures the method, uh, rest method in the first place. So that's the variant you see here, a bit more uh, simpler way of doing this. And basically the idea is here, okay, okay um, all right, do we, what do we have here right now? We have this um, in a request to a particular endpoint, this one here. Um, and of course, it will not necessarily run right now because there's no endpoint um, set up to this um, to, to deal with this. But our challenge is now, okay, how do we effectively kind of um, test it? So, and that's the, that's the whole idea here. So um, the, the um, tests here is provided in, of course, the main dot uh, main underscore test package that is uh, sits alongside here. And uh, if you look carefully at the bottom here, you find that there is one. Uh, well, there's actually two two uh, test functions that are that are kind of configured to um, provide some test functionality. So the first point here is um, how do we how do we now um, kind of emulate the um, response of the um, or how do we substitute this particular um, request that comes from um, you know is sponsored by the HTTP package with uh, a, one that is actually uh, testable in a way right where we can predefine a response here you see right now that you know whether it's where 
um, this ceased to invoke um, the URL localhost port 8080 with the po default client here, right? Can we find a meaningful way of substituting this one here uh, for a mocked, basically, um, server uh, instance or server side handler that kind of provides the response irrespective, for example, of the URL, so that we're not, uh, you know, um, affected by the fact that the URL is hard coded here. So, and the idea is basically quite um, quite straightforward. So, how does it work? Let's see. Here you see, so that's a kind of a typical test structure, basically. And the idea is here to substitute, um, use the same kind of call, structure request, you know, with the URL, whatever else. Um, and, uh, but instead of using the um, get request um, client um, as from the HTTP package, we can substitute it with a um, function that has the same signature of the resp uh, response effectively, because that's exactly what's happening fundamentally. Uh, you're invoking uh, a um, or sending a GET request to a particular endpoint and expecting a particular response in the form of the handler signature that we know already. So our challenge is then merely to replicate that response structure that we would get from such a handler, right? So um, that's that's the basic idea. So if we go into get from here, which is actually a function, we exactly have the same signature that the get um, request handler would have. So um, it basically takes the URL as a string, and it returns a response and potentially an error when if that's uh, a, a particular concern. So if I go back to main here and just um, over over this, you should see that the, the signature of the response from the get request via the default HTTP client is exactly the same one, right? So it has a get with the URL that's passed along, and then followed uh, and, uh, and, and, and receives as a response a response um, reference and a potential error code. So what's happening here is basically we replicate this this complete signature, different function name is meta, but the signature is the same. What can we do then? Well, we just emulate a server side response, right? So how does a server side response look like? Guess what? I mean the usual ones. Uh, including the um, provision of, uh, you know, first of all, we create a response, of course, um, which will then be this one here. And uh, we can signal that status code, uh, which is the HTTP response. So, of course, it needs to be HTTP response. And then we can set the different fields, right, as they're available by, by instantiating. So, we could send the status code, um, we get uh, status information, content lens, protocol information, uh, and whatever else. So, you have the full typical features that you would find and expect from a, a HTTP response. And we set some of them. So we have a header, and the header also has a content type. We can set that one as well, um, generally accessible via uh, res um, a response here, dot header being the header and body being the body. So those are the two kind of main points. In addition to that one, the status, I think that would be a standard one you want to kind of define. Um, and um, after having set the header, we can uh, create the message. This is where this message struct comes into play, because the idea is to have a prototypical, to have a prototypical structure for, um, um, you know, um, a JSON structure that you want to embed, so we can test a bit complexity on JSON as well. Um, and uh, basically, Marshall this, and this contents then becomes part of the body. So here's the body is written. So response body is IUtil, and basically takes um, the content, the Marshall content stringifies it and uh, wraps it into a, um, a, a, a byte buffer which then kind of um, attached to the, or serialized into the body of the message. And you return this one uh, and no error, so or nil error. Recall, um, you know, if the error is nil, that means there was no error. So basically you bluntly hard code the response here. That's what I, the point I want to make uh of um in this instance here um of, of the functionality so in here you can of course use uh you know functionality you implemented we talked about the, the or we had a look at this message struct for example if you had some sort of business logic or whatever else that would happen here you could implement implement this here as well and so on and um this is basically the response that the client would see um upon upon um, request so that's that one here, right? So we invoke basically now our own handler that substitutes a proper invocation that would be performed uh, with the um, um, standard Golang um, get client request, right? And then we can perform evaluations. So if we go further down, let's ignore this one here. We can check, for example, whether the error is nil, standard one, else we have a fatal call. So mind my 
equals to fatal. That's really more like a um, bit of a rigid uh, response. Um, and uh, status codes, for example, if the status code is wrong, uh, of course it won't be, then uh, this one is uh, um, throwing an error. If the content type, for example, doesn't correspond to application J, and so on, you can basically test through most of those um, uh, most of those features in as far as relevant, right? So, and finally, the the parsing of the JSON structure um, that um, yeah, this probably should fail as well anyway and um, see if the content does not correspond to what it's supposed to be. So, so basically it, it can test the entire content of this handler more or less as it's uh, provided, which can in fact um, basically include the server side functionality. All right, so if I run this thing, let's see if it actually works. It's at this to false. I get to that point in a second. Um, it will, yeah, it should run. This has run before, so. So, right, so, yeah, so the idea is effectively substitute the default HTTP GET um, request structure with something else. So you can actually, you know, um, the redirect, put your, basically move, put your handler in there, right? So that you actually want to test. And this handler can then hold the complete functionality that you want to expose to a third party user. So this tests um, basically your handler in a, in, a, in, in a dry sense, in a sense that, uh, it uh, emulates the behavior directly, but it does not actually include any sort of network interaction, right? So uh, simply by, by by taking the shortcut here, uh, we actually don't really need to interact truly using this URL. The URL is passed along into this handler, of course. Recall that this uh, the struct request function looks as follows. It basically calls the target function that has now been our, um, uh, uh, you know, replicated uh, response um, structure and uh, calls it with the URL as parameter. But as you have seen in our instance of the um, get from here um, a function, we actually don't do anything with the, uh, with, um, the uh, URL in particular, right? So URL is actually completely ignored. So it wouldn't matter what URL you put in there. It will always respond the same uh, structure in our instance. So that's the way of abstracting from here by simply substituting this at runtime. Okay, so this is one way of doing this. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is kind of directly invoking the handler. The system doesn't even know that it doesn't interact, uh, or Golang from this perspective at least, it doesn't even know that there's no, you know, uh, network connectivity involved, that the actual HTTP GET client is never invoked, you just get a direct response. Um, so, but in many instances, it may also be desirable to, um, of course, test this, including the kind of network structure. So you want to have a way of um, uh, tearing up and down a, um, you know, small or a separate HTTP server that kind of can pro provide you with basic functionality just for the sake of, of testing, right? So how can you use that handler uh, on an actual HTTP server and test whether it operates uh, according to spec? And that's where the second part comes to, uh, into play. So, um, so this was get from here before, but the second one here is basically this function called start HTTP server. And what's happening there? Well, what's the signature of this, this function in the first place? Um, well, effectively it returns an instance of an HTTP test server. Uh, and that one is actually a thing. So um, Golang has, as part of its HTTP test package, Um, a set of functionality that is just for that very purpose to test HTTP services because it's so um, centered around, of course, um, service provision in, in different ways. So, and it can uh, create instances of um, uh, TLS servers, so even emulate um, certificates um, providing services um, and standard HTTP service and so on, right? So, and meaning this can actually be used then for, uh, for invocation. So, you have the various functions for the instantiation, but more important, it allows you to uh, create a new uh, server with a given handler. So that's the basic signature that uh, we would be using here. So a new server and we provide it immediately with a handler. So the, the difference to 
um, the conventional server as we know it, um, the HTTP server that we use so far, is that the tear up and tear down is really straightforward and uh, quite simple. It doesn't have the complex um, path structure that we have, so we, we need to organize our API by different locations and so on. But instead, what it does is basically just uh, allowing you to test um, an individual handler. So you have a server, just pass the handler function as it is. Um, or you know, define it inline here, so it's kind of defined inline here, of course, um, and then perform your interaction on it, tear it down afterwards. So let's have a look at this. So this calls basically HTTP uh, test new server, and we immediately just provide. So there's no not this path prefix that we usually have. Just immediately provide the handler function that uh, you know we want to um, test. The handler function could be a reference, of course, to a function, but here we actually, uh, you know, again make it very explicitly inline. Um, yeah, and uh, provide the um, so here yeah, there you go. That's the whole that's the whole function effectively that we provide. Basically, it does the same thing as the one above. Just want to motivate the slightly different approach um, to to doing it here effectively. Um, that we uh, you know encode the message and write the whole thing um, back as it's um, supposed to be. So so that's the HTTP server. Basically, same functionality, but just starting it up. So I switched it here. By the way, the tests uh, are all available on um, in GitLab, so you can replicate all that by yourself uh, and play with this a bit. So basically, when using the, what's happening in order to create the HTTP service? Well, of course, we need to start an instance in the first place. We get a reference to it called defer server.close as well. Um, this will ensure that the server is actually closed down at the end of the test, right? So, um, so when before it runs out of scope, it will um, call close on the reference, so um, that the server teardown is managed for you, which is really convenient. So you don't ever need to deal with this. But the magic comes now. Okay, we have this HTTP server, um, but how do we know what the URL is, right? So because it doesn't allow us to specify much as part of our um, uh, um, you know, declaration of the server structure and so on. Um, and here the idea is basically just uh, the server URL once um, um, once run is actually responded, uh, you know, returned um, on the URL constant of the server, right? So you just call server.url, this will give you URL of the server and they can actually use. What we, we can do then is part of our actual invocation from a, from, a, from a testing point of view. Again, recall we have this request that we want to perform on a particular URL. Uh, but now we want to use the HTTP default client uh, again, because we now have reconstructed the network um, um, the structure again, that we have a server that has hosts this handler and our client that now needs to connect to the server. So we can, instead of responding directly with the handler, we now respond with the, um, or pass it through the HTTP get uh, request instance again. And that's what's happening here, right? So we use HTTP default client get, because we now know that's the URL to be invoked. So, See, does it resolve? Ah, no, that's just resolving to the um, original. Um, okay, so and then afterwards, the same same idea. We, you can basically perform exactly the kind of same tests, right? Because it should have the same status code, and it should, of course, process, should not return any error. Uh, we can read the contents, un unmarshal the message, and so on, get all this content out of the system. That's a basically uh, basically the the idea. Right, so so it's two variants, um, but it allows you to um, test the um, functionality that's provided by um, the, you know uh, on on a server side in particular uh, in in two different ways. Once without networking, directly invoking the handler, but giving the system the impression that is never less, or using the same basically API for for the in, uh, interactions. For example, if you uh, devise such a, a function to kind of uh, perform this linkage, you can uh, make it very interchangeable in a testing environment and um, the production environment. Um, or uh, we spin up a test server that takes the original handler as it is. You can basically just pass the handler by reference here into this new server and uh, tear it down afterwards. So you have complete network interaction, considering network interaction. Um, so those are the basic the basic functionality that we have in order to test some server side um, facility that it correspondingly um, responds. So one other aspect I wanted to show you, in addition to um, highlighting uh, um, the the Golang standard way of assessing or performing tests in, in the te testing package, in many other languages you will have found convenience um, function. Um, for example, in JUnit, if you did Java before, 
you will have the assert um, statements, right? So we make certain assertions about uh, a state, a desirable state of uh, variable values or whatever else, really. Um, and I just wanted to highlight there exists an equivalent for Golang as well. So if you're very comfortable with this and you want to use this because it's a bit richer, here you kind of need to reconstruct your tests or you know the test conditions more or less more or less manually right of comparing stuff and uh, constructing the response messages and so on um, but if you want to have more simple and um, uh, you know uh, concise signatures you could con consider using the um, testify assert package as well all those packages by the third party ones by the way are linked from uh, in our uh, wiki as well so you have a quick reference to it and um, this sponsors you with uh, different uh, primitives for performing the testing so this is the same function as above the only difference is that the tests are performed using um, the assert statements. So I'll just show you that in a second. So um, same principle, you can do it with or without HTTP server. It doesn't really matter, you get the response you want to assess. And I kind of, for the sake of uh, uh, illustration, I left the original um, uh, test, uh, test there and just added the new assert statement, the additional or the alternative assert statements as well, just to signal, um, you know, how, yeah, how, how much, um, more simple or expressive, I guess, also, the, and those statements actually are. So it's an alternative. There's no obligation to use them. I'm just highlighting it, especially for the ones that are acquainted with them from other programming languages. So it's quite good to know that Golang has that in principle as well uh, via third party um, libraries. But those libraries have been around for a long time and are fairly stable. So I wouldn't hesitate to uh, use them, to be honest. Um, this one, at least, has been around since 2017 and has continuously been in the developed um, as well. But what can you do? Well, you know, those assertions can, for example, say, uh, like assert that, uh, you know, something is nil. So that's a quick way of doing the error testing instead of writing this out here. So assert nil, you always pass the reference to the um, test runner, which is passed through from your um, test function in the first place, yeah. as in all cases. And um, basically, then the variable you want to test for and the message you want to offer in response. And then um, this, this function deals with the assessment um uh, you know basically writing the conditional and um formatting the response message correspondingly if there's um errors similarly for the equal for example the third equal assume that this one so and if you look at the signature it also signals the um the, the content of the argument so um it, again you pass the test runner and then the expected value test data is okay if, if you want and then the actual value here for example which comes out of the response important to get this right if you use this kind of approach right otherwise you get the wrong reporting so what's the expected value and what's the actual value and then you basically can also provide a message that is produced only in the case of a uh, violation of those um, um, test provisions similar here testing for example for the header uh, something you can do um and so on a certain nils um so yeah and then if here's for example a slightly like a different one uh you can also assert non-nil of course you want to assume that the message that has been produced is part of the uh, unmastering deserialization is of course not nil then this can be tested as well um and you know you can test the actual content uh, again using dot assert dot equals as one of the um, of, um yeah basic principles there as well okay so what else do we have yeah so there's quite a bit there um also matching facilities so if you have an approximate matching um an exact matching um, you can test for existence of files for example that are produced as part of the um execution um handler body ah right you can also test hand the handler body the http body directly right so you can instead of doing all this serialization and testing this incrementally you can just say hey you know ensure that the body contains the following or contains only right so it doesn't need to be exact um that the status code is such right so right now i did mainly to maintain the parallel um, structure to the original statements that we did but you can test those uh, as well by calling those um, signatures so very rich in in, in facilities that it offers um uh, or less or equal so comparators um are also provided not equal uh, you can test using regular expressions we didn't really talk about this much but uh, that's one way as well of testing uh, string structure um performing string structure mat matching similarity matching and um so yeah so bear in mind this assert packet is quite quite rich it's probably something that's very useful that we can um consider um employing more 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 extensively in the 
uh, for, for testing if you wanted to. So, all right. So this gave a bit of a sense of the, 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 the client side. Um, and I haven't really, I wanted to also sort of talk about the, uh, you know, how to assess um, behavior and, um, from, from the um, perspective or the client behavior, right? So we haven't really talked about this. So, but I think in the interest of time, because that will take me a bit um, to walk through this idea, um, I'll probably leave it for next uh, for our next session because we we covered quite a rich set of different um, topics already um, 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 today, right? Starting with the idea that uh, okay, making up for the buckets, I guess uh, you got a, a sense uh, of this functionality. But more importantly, the stubbing that are motivated earlier. So how can you uh, support your development, uh, but possibly also your testing by providing a mocked up service that you can uh, provide with the actual payload data from the actual system. Uh, quite straightforwardly, this um, this um, is provided, as I mentioned before, in the repository, course repository. Let me just bring it up to be really explicit about this. Um, see what shows up. Rest up here, yeah, this one here, right? That's basically this one. So if you uh, want to use it for your development, feel free to do so, or a variant thereof, uh, if you liked. Um, so the um, that's the basic basic uh, structure. The second aspect I showed you was basically how to perform HTTP testing uh, with focus on you know um, uh, assessing uh, kind of so uh, handlers in particular, right? Either by direct invocation of handlers by substituting of the substituting the request uh, get client, or by using the HTTP test server, which is a really powerful feature that Go comes with it out of the box. And um, also looked at the different forms of how you can actually perform the evaluations, either directly on the test runner itself, which is quite straightforward. Uh, or manually, if you like, which is quite straightforward, and then you can uh, signal notifications to via the test runner, or you use, for example, the assert framework, which is basically giving you the richer um, features that you find from other programming languages as well. So that's found here um, with some brief, brief, brief discussion. But you can uh, have a look there as well if you want to rerun this on your own machine and kind of reconstruct what's actually happening here uh, in detail. So it's called HTTP test examples. So it's exactly the uh, Rape I just um, showed you. Okay. Yes. So that's the main point. I also provided some resources um, in response to the testing concern in particular right now, uh, related to uh, link to the HTTP test uh, package uh, and the, the testify one as well. That's that's the one that has the assertions in there. And what I haven't talked about is mocking in in Golang. So I'll probably yeah I will do that next week then um it kind of to to complete the picture a bit so um that will make more sense than next week and also provided some links uh, to kind of the differentiation between uh, mocks and stops in as far as relevant or of interest for you okay so i leave it this for um this particular session but at least you have hopefully a starting point on how to think about testing um for your or, or stubbing uh, for your development or your quality assurance of your project so it's something that's really important so um last thing i hope there is some progress on the group formation in terms of the project because that will be very important for for us to get started and going given that um there's not really much time uh, left i hadn't seen any issues um yeah and there was no new issue right now either um about people searching for groups or looking still for partners um, I, I think it will be quite imminent if you haven't already to kind of find a group and, uh, you know, narrow it in uh, on the different topics. I saw there were some updates on the uh, topical list. I'm not bringing it up for privacy reasons right now, but um, so just ensure that you uh, find opportunity to sharpen your proposals a bit more and also to add your groups there. So we get a good overview of who is actually already organized in groups and who is not, because else uh, I think only sensible move would be to, um, you know, bring the rest kind of together or in, set up groups, I guess, then um, to ensure that people um, are actually paired up in order to produce some meaningful output. Okay. Um, as you have a lot of talk on my side, um, questions from yours? So I understand that the way I see it, we need to keep an eye on the um, 
Corona situation, I would like to have a present lecture again. Uh, lectures again. I mean, I strongly prefer, prefer this um, for for the many reasons. The worst being that I don't really get or get far less feedback in this kind of forum than I would get in a present setting. Um, but as of now, and you kind of want to keep an eye on this particular URL as linked here in the issues. Um, the the state of the, the decision appears to be that we still have um, until nineteenth of April um, that we don't really have any presence um, uh, in, 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 for lecture, uh, for lectures that is, uh, in the university. So let's see how this, this plays out and if it changes in, in due course so that we can find an opportunity to meet in person again. But um, that's something we need to operate on. So we need to keep a bit of an eye on this. So I encourage you to do the same as well. And then we get a better be bearing as to when we can meet back in person in, in our usual classroom environments. Okay, so um, homework for you. Um, well, reflect on testing, but more importantly, reflect on your project, right? Ensure that your description is hard and fast. You think about the technological requirements, think about your features more importantly. Um, and um, so we get a good overview and then you can start getting productive in terms of your development as well. Um, next week, I'll continue with the mocking initially, and then we move to virtualization slash Docker as a topic, which is very important for this course. So thank you very much for your attention today and uh, see you next week. <laughs>